Um, we have been going through a series in the book of 1 John called Loved to Love. And uh, we do have our sermons up on a podcast and on YouTube. If you've missed any of those or been down in kids' church, I would encourage you to get caught up. But this is a cool way to preach because you can literally just read 1 John during the week at home. Uh, you can read it before church. You can read it after church and see what God has for you as you soak in this message. And we've been using an illustration of soaking in a message. This illustration that you see up on the screen, we've been doing this every week because we want you to get a feel for it. And I'm gonna go through it uh, just briefly here. The idea is that God loves us. And lots of 1 John has to do with God loving us. God loves you, he loves you, he loves you, he loves you. And that's the idea of us being the sponge and we go into God's love and we soak in it. And we soak in it, and we soak in it, and we soak in it. And when you come to church, you hear about God's love for you. He loves you, he loves you, he loves you, he loves you. And this is really, 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 really important. And we've done sermons about how uh, this is the first step and the most important step, but we're not meant to live uh, in the, the water pitcher. We're not meant to live at church. We're not meant to just do religious things and be religious. What we're meant to do is go out into the world. And when you soak in God's love, what naturally is bound to happen, according to 1 John, is the sponge drips. I'm not pushing down on the sponge. I'm not working hard. I'm, I'm not exerting effort here. I've been in Jesus' love. And so as I soak in his love and I go out into the world, into my workplace, into my neighborhood, into my family, God's love drips from me to saturate a dry world. We'd all agree the world is dry, right? The world is dry. And Jesus is full of life. He, he is life. He is, he is light. He is the water that our world needs. So this is the analogy that we've been looking at during this series. Now, today we're going to look at 1 John 2, 15, 16, and 17. We'll have the whole passage up there uh, after we do our, our next round of discussion questions. Uh, but I just want to start with the first verse, and it says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. Now, for me, growing up in Baptist churches back in the 80s and 90s, I have to say, this is not talking about rock and roll music, okay? God is a fan of rock and roll music. Uh, God, God created music. He created the earth. The earth is good. The earth has been corrupted by sin, but it was created good, and it is God's. Okay, so let's get that out of the way. What he's talking about when he says world is sin, and he, he expounds on that in verse 16. We'll see that here in a moment. He actually lists out sins that we'll be talking about uh, today. But what John is saying as he introduces this section, and he's been talking about this, this God being your option to find life, as he's saying there's another option. You have, you have two choices of where to find your life. You can find it in God, option one, or you can find it in the world, option two, okay? Now, this appetizing has a good aroma to it coming off of it right now. Uh, beverage is a, is, a, is a mixture of Windex, apple cider vinegar, milk, old coffee grinds, and then water. I'm not sure, I think that's the coffee, I don't know what that is. I think we created a new element. A new, I think there's a new element on the periodic table in this picture right here. Um, but you can see that these two things are incompatible, right? If I were to pour some of this into here, this instantly is ruined. Does that make sense? And it doesn't really matter how much of this I pour into here. This ain't getting any better. <laughs> so when John says that don't love the world or anything in the world, if you love the world, the love of the Father's not in you, he's being pretty black and white about this. He's, he's pretty polarized about it. What he's saying is these two things are incompatible. That, that, and you can see why when you see them visually. If I were to put a sponge in here, which I'm not going to do because I think it would disintegrate the sponge, um, and I want to use this next week still. <laughs> but if you were to put the sponge in here, um, the, the sponge then would drip, 
as it goes out into the world. If the sponge fills itself with the love of the world, and we're going to get into that in verse 16, it talks about the, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. These are the three things John signals out as what he's calling the world. We would go drip this nasty stuff wherever we go throughout the world. And we experience that, don't we? You, you run into people and, and people that are very selfish and people that don't care about others and, and you go, man, the world is full of brokenness, right? And, and sometimes it can, it, can feel, it can feel like a dark place because of that. Okay, so a couple discussion questions for you. If you're new, we do this every Sunday. Uh, we have our discussion questions earlier. This is our last one that we'll do. Uh, and then we'll do the rest of the sermon. But these are just ways we want to get your, your cogs turning a little bit. I try to not use words like sin and things like that because if you're not a Christian today and you're visiting, you're not familiar with church, we want you to know there's no wrong answer. You don't have to know a bunch about God or the Bible or anything. And we want you to be comfortable answering these questions. So if you don't feel comfortable, feel free to just listen uh, as others answer in your group. But the first question is, why are the ways of sin or the world, I just put it in quotes because that's the word John used, why is it so appealing? Why, why is it so appealing uh, to go against the things that God says? It's obviously appealing because so many people do it. We do it. We struggle with it. We have our temptations. We have all these things. Just why is it, why is it so appealing just in a very general sense, not asking you to get into any specifics at all? And then number two, um, why, uh, how does sin end up dripping the opposite of love? So if I were to dunk this sponge in here and drip it around the gym, you would see the opposite of love dripping from this sponge. In the world, as you look at the world, again, just in general terms, um, how do you see the opposite of love happening in the, in the world today? Uh, whether that's in, uh, in your, your micro uh, piece part of the world or the macro world that you see in. If you have a, a Bible, you're welcome to open it up. We'll have the text here up on the screen. You're welcome to open it up on your phone uh, if you want to follow along there. Uh, 1 John 2, 15 to 17, it's just three verses. Uh, it says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Now, you'll see a couple words I have in yellow up on the screen. Hopefully, you can see that, uh, the word lust and the word desires. In uh, the Greek, so the New Testament was written in Greek, and there's no Greek word for what we would call lust. It's the word desire. It's the same word. So the same Greek word there, lust, lust, desire. In English, we have different words. In Greek, it's the same word. And there's something really interesting about that. Uh, the, the translators will turn it to lust when the desire is around sexual things. Uh, they're outside of marriage. You'll see, the, you'll see the, the translators turn it in to lust. It's usually used in a negative way in Scripture. It's usually about the desires of the flesh, the desires of the world, etc. But it's kind of interesting. If you look at these three passages here, um, nothing too deep. I just want to show you that sometimes the same word desire in the Greek, the same word translated lust, is used in a positive sense. I desire to depart and be with Christ. Think about saying that. I, I lust to be depart. I, lu you know, I lust to depart and be with Christ. It's, it's, it's very strange when you think of it that way, but it's the same Greek word. I, uh, Jesus says, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you. Jesus is desiring this with his disciples. Uh, in 1 Thess Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, that's a hard word to say. Uh, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. It's the same word. The word just means desire. And it got me thinking. It got me thinking that the idea, or the point I want to make, is that desire is not a sin. The Bible shows that. The way it uses the word for lust, desire is not a sin. In fact, God created you for desire. Sin is misplaced desire. Okay, so let me say that again. Desire is not a sin. God created you for desire. Sin is misplaced desire, right? Think about this, even this nasty thing here. Most of this is all things you, besides the Windex, most of this is stuff you would put into your body. Water, milk, apple cider vinegar you might use in a recipe or something potentially, uh, and uh, coffee, you know, you brew coffee. It's just misplaced, right? It's, it's all misplaced. It's in the wrong order. 
and the Windex is supposed to be on the mirror, not in the, it's not, not in the, in the water pitcher, right? Sexual lust is misplaced desire for intimacy. And I, I don't say it's misplaced desire for sex. We're going to talk about that a little bit, okay? But it's a misplaced desire for intimacy. Sex and intimacy are two different things. Our culture today doesn't know the difference. So you'll, you'll hear our culture say things like, um, we were intimate, like that means we had sex. But think about all the sex that happens in the world where there's no intimacy whatsoever, okay? Whether that's, you know, just some one-night stand or prostitution or, or whatever it may be. Sex does not mean intimacy. Uh, you can have sex in a marriage where there's no intimacy, right? So we, we as a culture, we say, we, we, we're obsessed with sex because what we're really after is intimacy. And our culture doesn't know, the world, as, as John calls it, doesn't know how to get true intimacy, so we take these, these substitutes, these things that, that give us a feeling of intimacy, uh, and we, we go for them over and over and over again. But sexual lust, it's a misplaced desire for intimacy. Number one, intimacy with God. We were created to be in an intimate relationship with God. God calls himself our father, so then we are his child. Think about the intimate relationship between a parent and a child. It's a very non-sexual intimacy, right? Really, I'd say the closest intimacy you can have. Think of a, a mother breastfeeding a baby. That's one of the metaphors Scripture uses for us. I believe it's Psalm 131. That is the metaphor uh, used in Psalm 131. It's a very short, beautiful psalm. Um, intimacy, God is our Father, we as his children. The Bible also calls uh, our relationship with Jesus between a bride and a bridegroom. The church is the bride, Jesus is the groom. Intimacy. There is a root core level of intimacy that you and I were created to have with God. Every person on this planet was created to have that level of intimacy with God. That's what makes me a whole person. I'm a whole person because I know that I'm a beloved son of the Father, a beloved child of the Father. He loves me and invites me to love him back. That makes me whole. Our culture thinks I'll find wholeness in a woman. I'll find wholeness in sex. And so I'm a half person, and if I find the right person, they'll complete me, and, and they're also a half person, and if they find the right person, then I will complete them, and we're both looking to the other person to give us what only God can give us. And so for those of you that are single, I, I would guess that you have a longing in you potentially for the right person, and in that feeling and thinking, that right person will make you whole, and you're looking for that person to give you what only God can give you. For those of you that are married, I'm guessing that you, you, you have struggles in your marriage, and you look to your spouse, and you say, why isn't my spouse giving me intimacy in all these different ways? Why aren't they giving it to me? And there's things you can work on in your marriage, absolutely. Go to marriage counseling and talk and get those things worked out. But at the end of the day, your spouse can never give you the truest intimacy that you were created to have with God our Father and through Jesus, who's our, our groom, and we are his bride. Your spouse is not Jesus. Your boyfriend or girlfriend is not Jesus. The person you wish was your spouse is not Jesus. Only Jesus is Jesus. So we find this intimacy with God, but throughout scripture, the Bible talks over and over about community, about community, about community, about community. I don't think when, when, when Genesis, uh, early chapters of Genesis says it's not good for man to be alone, so he created Eve, he was talking exclusively about marriage. You, you look throughout the Old Testament, you look at the book of Ecclesiastes, and it, it, it talks about um, three strands not easily broken, and we, I've heard it in a, I was at a wedding once, and the pastor said, yep, three strands, that's the husband, the wife, and God. No, it's not. That's not what the author of Ecclesiastes is talking about. Because in the same context, he's saying, because back then there was no heat back then, you'd be in the middle of winter, you're cold, it says, if you lay down together, you're going to keep warm. It wasn't sexual, it was talking about survival. You had to have people around you literally to help you keep warm at night. This idea of community was essential to life. I don't know if you knew this, you, pro you, you, you probably have heard this, it's not, it's not groundbreaking. The United States is the most individualistic society that has ever existed on the planet. So as long as our planet's been around, as long as there's been humanity, and today of all countries that exist, we are the most individualistic of any culture that's ever existed, which means you can do it alone, you're a lone ranger, 
uh, you don't need others, and then we get married, and then we, we silo off in our marriages, and we do it alone, and we don't need others. And throughout the whole New Testament, the church was called a family. And over and over again, it was called the family of God, the family of God, the family of God, brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters. There is healthy intimacy that happens in community, and we all need it. We all need it. And when we don't have it, we go looking for it in other places. When I don't have the healthy to soak in, I go looking for it wherever I can find it. And I go, well, this is wet. It will do. And I jump in. Half of marriages end in divorce. So obviously marriage isn't a, a great place to find this either, right? Now, I will say marriage is the place that God designed for the act of sex, okay? So that isn't, that's a whole nut. We're going to do a sermon series on sex. We're going to talk about that. But I just want to be clear that that is God's design for sex, for sexual intimacy. But sex and intimacy are not synonyms. There's many types of intimacy, and there's a deeper level of intimacy than sexual intimacy that we are all wired for. And we can find that in our relationship with Christ and in the community that the family of God is meant, uh, meant to provide, is meant to offer. Now, Back to John here. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. There's a sexual connotation here to the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, uh, and then the pride of life we're going to talk about at the end. So we're, we're going back to the idea of loved to love. Okay, This idea that when I, when I soak in God's love, when, when he loves me, he loves me, he loves me, when I go from here, my hope is when you interact with me that this is what you experience. That's my hope is that you, you experience the love of God coming from me, whether you are a man or whether you are a woman. One thing that's really interesting about Jesus is that women were drawn to him. He had many women disciples, uh, many very important women in the New Testament, and I'm often drawn to the Samaritan woman at the well in John 4. She was a woman who had had five husbands. She was living with a man that wasn't her husband, and especially in the first century, that would have been very, very, very taboo. Uh, commentators believe uh, the fact that she was drawing water from the well at the middle of the day, the hottest part of the day in Israel, in the desert, that's not when you'd go to draw water. Why was she drawing water then? Because she was the social pariah of the community, because the other woman, women wouldn't associate with her. And John 4 is a beautiful chapter. Read it when you get home. Uh, she becomes one of the first evangelists in the New Testament church. She, she meets Jesus, she's drawn to him, and she leads her whole town to Jesus. Now, what if Jesus had decided he was going to lust over her the way uh, many other men seem to do? How would that have affected the way she experienced the love of God coming from Jesus? Mary Magdalene, uh, the, woman, the, the woman who washed Jesus' feet with her hair in Luke 7, who some translations call... A, sinful woman, a woman who may have been a prostitute in town. These women were drawn to Jesus because he did not sexualize them. He, he didn't sexualize them. He saw them as human beings. So here's what our culture does when it comes to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. In here I have some Aldi bought, 100% uh, grass-fed ground beef. We are an Aldi family at our house. Uh, I'm too cheap. I, I, I should have brought a steak in, but I'm too cheap, so I don't buy steak because uh, I don't know how to cook it, and it's too expensive. But we went with the ground beef. It is simple. It's organic. So, okay. What our culture does with sex, whether you're a man or a woman, is we've, we've reduced what God created to be a, a, a beautiful act between a husband and a wife. The, the metaphor throughout Scripture, the bride and the bridegroom, is, is depicted in a human marriage, sexual relationship that has the covenant bond of marriage around it, a covenant bond that says, I'm with you forever, no matter what. Uh, what do we say in our vows? For better or worse, for richer or poorer, I'm here with you. My, my vows to you, to my wife, who's here in church, I mean, you know, she's always here, she's a lot of times she's out there. On our anniversary, she was like, she's in there. <laughs> but we made vows to each other, and it was to see each other as human beings, and to accept one another as fully human with all of our flaws. And look, I know marriage is hard, and some marriages don't make it, and, and we live in a fallen world, right? But this is the design. This is the design. What culture's done is they've, they've taken sex, 
and they've turned both men and women into this. They've turned both men and women into this, where uh, cer you've certainly heard it before. Usually it's men talking about women and saying, did, did you see her? Did you see that? And it's usually a that. It's an it and a that. When women start being talked about as an it and a that, we know that we have gone from this pitcher of water into this one. Okay? An it and a that. And different body parts are talked about as if a woman were a piece of beef. A piece of beef, if you were going to go to the market, you know, to the deli section, the butcher section, and you're like, I want that one, and I want that one, and that one looks good. And then what do you do with the meat? You eat it. If you were at McDonald's or Burger King, you get your burger, you eat it, you have that wrapper. What do you do with the wrapper? Throw it in the garbage, and you move on to your next meal. And we've reduced both men and women into fast food hamburgers that are meant to be consumed and thrown into the garbage and moved on to the next one and the next one and to the next one. Here in John, in 1 John, this was earlier when Josh preached two weeks ago, and it's going to come again in a few chapters. John literally says, um, if you don't love your brother or sister, the love of God isn't in you. So how can I love my sister in this case if I'm turning her into this? Do you see how incompatible those two things are? I'm filled with the love of the Father, but instead of showing you the Father's love, I'm going to turn you into an object. So when you hear objectification, that's what our culture has done to the whole concept of sex. Sex becomes about me and fulfilling my selfish desires. And what's wild about our culture in 2022 is we, the world, have completely normalized this. What I just explained to you is the absolute norm in almost every sector of our culture um, outside, outside of you know, close, your, your close Christian friends that, that, that might have you as an accountability partner or something, outside of that, where, where you go, this is the norm. Now, now, for me, and I'll share my story more in length in another sermon, but I started looking at pornography when I was in seventh grade. That was in the, the mid-90s. I'm 39 now. In the mid-90s is when families got the internet in their homes. And so when I hit adolescence is when the internet came into my house and Christian families didn't really even realize there was porn on the internet and that their Christian kids would go on and start looking at it. And I did and became addicted, and it completely warped my brain. And, and through a six, seven-year addiction to porn, through into Christian college as I'm studying to become a pastor, I've had to work the rest of my life with God to renew my mind, like Victoria read earlier from Romans 12, to renew my mind back to his original intent, for how we are to view women and ourselves. Because in this process of objectification, in this process of turning uh, women or men into meat, we turn ourselves into that too. And culture says oftentimes to women, but also to men, that that's what you are. That you're, you're, you, you, you need to display yourself in that way so that you can get attention and validation and all these things. At the end of the day, we want intimacy. And the more attention I get, from someone that's attractive to me, if I think you're attractive and you give me attention, now I've been validated. That is a fake form of intimacy. What I'm really after is the, is the true thing, the real thing. But I said I was in seventh grade when the internet came out. Now guys, this was the internet on a desktop computer. This was dial-up internet. This was, this was not what we have today, right? I was raised on that from seventh grade on. Today, kids, have these, okay? Kids, little kids, have these. These are full of pornography. They are full of all kinds of things that are very, very, very sexualized. We're going to talk about that in a little bit, okay? Now, check out some of these stats. 20 to 60% of teens today participate in sexting. Uh, sexting is where you take a photo of one of your sexual body parts, or video, and you send it, you text it to a friend. Um, 90, uh, this is an interesting too. If you survey teens and say, how many of your friends do you think sexed? Teens think that 90% of their friends sexed, okay? So teens think all their friends are doing this. Many of them are. 
34% of singles have had sex before their first date. It has a word, it's called interview sex. So whereas uh, I was raised and I teach and believe you save sex for marriage, um, one third of singles, before they have a first date, before we go out to coffee or dinner, let's have sex first to see if you're worth the, the $15 check at Starbucks. One third. <laughs> That's from um, Match.com does a singles in America survey. If you, if you ever want to be <laughs> filled with despair, <laughs> um, read the singles in America survey. Oh, there's, more, there's stuff I, I don't even feel comfortable mentioning in the sermon uh, on there. 20% of married couples have experimented with consensual non-monogamy, what we call open marriage. One out of five married couples has experimented with open marriage where you consensually give permission to go have sex with other people within your marriage. My point to this is not to go old school church and to say the world is so bad and if you participate in these things, you're so bad, okay? I'm not, my point is just to show how normal this has become in our culture. How we, th that's this water right here, okay? And it, when you look at music and TV and movies and social media, what used to be X-rated, like legit, you'd have R-rated movies and X-rated movies. Instead of being in an X-rated movie, you literally can just find it on Netflix now. You can literally just find it on Amazon, Amazon Prime on these shows that we consider normal shows to watch or normal movies to go to. It has become normal. And kids don't know any better. As adults, some, depending on your age, you were raised in this from your childhood. I'm not shaming you whatsoever. Oh, I'm in the boat with you. Trust me. We all need Jesus' grace. We need to live in this and dive in it and continue to pray for renewal. And we're going to get to some of that as much as we can in one uh, short sermon. But my, my point is, kids don't know any better. There's a documentary called Nefarious, and it's about sex trafficking around the world. And what, I, I watched it a while ago, 10, 12 years ago. Something that sticks out to me they were interviewing uh, a village in Cambodia. And the little girls in Cambodia, they're, they're literally raised from infancy um, to become uh, women in, this, in the trafficking industry. And one of the, I think it was a missionary type of person there, was in the village. His, his goal was to try to rescue these girls. And he said in the interview, it's really hard to rescue them when they don't want to leave and their families don't want them to leave. Now, I'm not characterizing the whole global industry, but just in this one village, they would interview these little girls and they'd show them putting on makeup. And in the village, for whatever reason, by Satan's twisting, Satan was able to convince this village that that's what the purpose of these girls were. That was their purpose. It's where they got their value from. That's how they felt beautiful. And they had 10-year-old girls putting on makeup and there was like an initiation age when it began. And it was almost... I, you'd have to watch it. Um, but my point is, kids don't know any better. And when this is what's being put into kids' baby bottles, and this is what's being put into their sippy cups and into their little Capri Sun packets, and then they get one of these, it's only a matter of time. And, and think about the formation of a brain from childhood into adolescence, into high school, into adulthood. And you have, and that's how you get these stats. That's how you get these stats. We're told it's how you get attention. We're told it's how you find, you find value, except you know what? You won't find value there. That's why you have to do it again, right? This is very, very addictive because you think you're going to find value there. If you drink vinegar, it will not quench your thirst. It will make you more thirsty, so you have to drink more of it and more of it and more of it. It is an empty promise from Satan. Okay, let's talk about verse 16. He says, the pride of life, he, he mentioned at the end of 16, the, number three, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. This is another one where it's helpful. We don't always know what the word pride even really means. Um, the word's used twice in the New Testament, same Greek word, is used in James 4, 16 as arrogant. He says, you boast in your arrogant schemes, all such boasting is evil. I think we get a little more, can get our heads around what the word arrogant means. So the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. These are the ways of the world, okay? That's what John's saying. There's arrogance, the pride of life. There's arrogance in choosing my way over God's way. 
There's arrogance in choosing the world's way over God's way. God provides himself as our source of life, and he says, drink from me. Pretty good option. But we have a second option. It's here, and we often choose it. For whatever reason, you talked about it in your five minutes with your group, we go to this one, and the world goes to this one over and over and over. This really smells. I have to keep it away from me. (laughs) But every sin, including Adam and Eve's, every sin I commit is this at the root, right here, arrogance. I had the little silly putty man in week one. God created the silly putty man. Silly putty man gave God the silly putty middle finger and (laughs) rebelled against him. And now there's a chasm between us. And Jesus makes it right. We're going to celebrate communion. Jesus makes it right. But our sin is rebellion against God. It's arrogance. The pride of life is me saying, my way is better than your way, God. And come on, with sex, don't we do that so much? Culture does that. I do that. You do that. God, the world's way is better than your way. I'll watch this show if I want to. The world's way is better than your way. I'll do this with my you know, boyfriend, girlfriend if I want to. The world's way is better than your way. I'll look at this if I want to. The pride of life. Last verse, the world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Now, John lays it out clearly here. The ways of the world are going to pass away. You can have your, your momentary hit, your momentary drug, your momentary dopamine hit. It's going to pass away. But God's ways are forever. Here's the thing. Satan wants to poison you. And if this is Satan's bottle of poison, he does not do this. Anyone remember Mr. Yuck? Yes, okay. Satan does not do this. He does not say, this is a bottle of poison. Don't you want to drink it? Mmm, smell it. Waft it in. Anyone? Raise your hand. Come forward and drink. Does Satan ever do that in our lives? No! You know what Satan does? He takes the poison. Raise your hand if you had coffee this morning. Oh, guess what I put in the coffee? Oh, you're never going to know what I brewed in there. I'm just messing with you. I didn't. But that's what Satan does. He takes the poison and he puts it right in the coffee and he brews it in so you can't even smell it. You can't even taste it. Those cupcakes out there, oh boy. (laughs) Satan baked the poison right into the cupcakes. You had no idea. Cover that in frosting, gulp it on down, no clue. Come on, this is our world, right? This is why we're ingesting so much poison, because it's all around us, and it's brewed into and baked into the things that we think are normal, and it feels good temporarily. It feels good temporarily, which is why it's so hard to convince somebody of. Try convincing a teenager, or even yourself. Try convincing somebody that God's ways of, of sex are better than the world's ways. Only a repentant heart Only a heart that's went before God and the Holy Spirit has entered and said, I repent of my sin. I don't want to follow the world's ways. I want to follow your way, God. It's going to be, I I desire this. Only a repentant heart is going to want this and is going to do what's necessary to put the people and the tools around them so that we can live in God's love for us and not in the world's. Now, this is a, a picture here from the Marvel series Moon Knight. And uh, I'm a Marvel nerd. Uh, what's happening in this scene is uh, the main character, I, I guess in a nutshell I could explain it, that um, he kind of has this, there's two of him that live inside of him, and he doesn't know it. And so he'll um, go to sleep, and then in the middle of the night he'll be out somewhere else in some other city, like killing people or whatever, right? And he doesn't know why it's happening. So he takes a, you know, like a chain of some kind, and he puts it around his ankle, and then he ties it to his bed, and you have these scenes, you don't know what's happening, but he'll, his body will try to rush out to this other place, and then the chain stops him, and he falls like this on his face. And I want to use this as a picture to talk briefly. Man, I'm trying to wrap up here. It's hard. I can get going on this all day, guys. Um, The difference of willful sin versus those of you and I that struggle with addictions, okay? So so there's sins that we we choose. When it comes to sex, there's things you choose, you could easily choose. I can choose to drink this water or this water. I'm not drinking this one. 
I'm going to drink this one. There's certain things, and we're all different. We all have different pasts. We all have different ages. We were exposed to pornography. That's going to play a role in this as well. We have different things that happen in our background and different, different things that we have to work through that's going to play into how susceptible to this sin is. Your age is going to play into this. There's many things that are going to play into this. But there's things that are willful that we choose. And let's be real, there's physiological addictions out there too. Porn is one of them. Alcohol is one of them. Drugs are one of them. And I know I've had to overcome a pornography addiction. And I still have to have lots of accountability in my life to help me stay here, which is where I want to be, but I can't stay here alone. The pride of life. What's the other word for pride? Arrogance. Arrogance says I can do it alone. I'm strong. So what I want to talk to you about briefly is how basically to do this to yourself if you struggle with addiction, okay? The sober one, which is you now listening, okay? Which is you listening to this sermon. You're sober right now. You're good right now. You need to get the upper hand on the addicted one. There's the addicted Noah and the sober Noah. And the sober Noah needs to get the upper hand on the addicted Noah. Because when, when you're alone and nobody else is around and that addicted self comes out, I don't care what sermon you heard. I don't care how much of this water you soaked in and how much healing you've done. If you don't have locks on that cage that the addicted one is in, it's coming out. And you might think if you're not an addict and you don't struggle with addictive behavior, you might think, what's wrong with you? Stop doing that stupid thing. Just keep that thing in the cage. Whether it's drugs, alcohol, pornography, it could be many other things as well. But what we have to do is, is do both the work of healing our hearts and finding intimacy in Jesus and finding the true healthy community, the, the healthy relationship with God that we're after, but we also need to lock up the addicted self. We need to do both. Okay, so I'm going to give you a few tools on how to do that so that when the addicted self comes up and they try to go finding what they're looking for, they can't. They can't. You can't. And you starve that sucker out. You starve it to death until it grows weak and feeble and it stops trying to get out of the cage to start with. And that is possible. Okay? So this is my last slide. This is my last slide. Okay? So a couple tools. Um, do this. Could everybody pull their phone out? Just everybody do this for me? Everybody, please pull it out. Point it at the screen and just take a picture of the screen, okay? Just do that because if, if you, you know, I use this, I need it. I know the, I know the feeling like I don't want to take a picture of that because people know that I have issues. We all have issues. Welcome to the club. Take a picture of this, please, just so you have it. Okay, a couple quick resources. If you're struggling with uh, pornography, please know you can come talk to me as well. Um, Coverandize.com, you can get accountability software on your phone. I have it. I use it. I need it, okay? It's, um, I don't have a lot of time, but it sends out reports to somebody you choose of the stuff you're looking at, basically. I have a promo code called Beyond. It goes along with my book. You get free 30 days, okay? So use it. I use it. I need it. Uh, did you know I wrote a book on this? That's why I can't preach in 30 minutes on this, okay? So uh, it's a book for guys. Uh, Beyond the Battle, a man's guide to his identity Christ in an over-sexualized world. But on version, that cool fancy little app, uh, there's a free seven-day devotional on Beyond the Battle, but it's, it's both for men and women changed it up. So check that out. I lead seven-week small groups. If you're a guy, you can jump onto beyondthebattle.net and go through this uh, for seven weeks with me and some awesome leaders. And then lastly, 90 Days to Wholeness by Crystal Renaud Day is an awesome 90-day book for women, uh, as well as it's free on version. So this is really cool. You can read this, go through this with some friends. Um, it's about uh, pornography addiction. Uh, this is for sure an issue that men and women face jointly today. So a um, couple other things. Um, tools. If you're struggling with substance abuse, talk to your doctor. Talk to a counselor. Get community. Start going to AA meetings. Start going to recovery meetings. Start going to celebrate recovery meetings. Come talk to me. I'll help you get plugged in. Please know there's not shame in this. Like we, This is the world we live in. We live in this world. To get, out of, to get out of this and into this, we need help. We can't do it alone. I'm in it with you. I need help. I need help. I have help. <laughs> okay. I can't do it alone. A couple other things. Intimacy with Jesus, so important. Intimacy with healthy community, so important. Remember, arrogance says, I can do it alone. I don't need this community. I don't need these tools. And today, I'm, I'm just offering you a choice 
You have picture number one here. We're going to celebrate here in a moment at the communion table. And we have picture number two here. Number one, choose picture number one with all your willful self. Choose it today. Repent. Put it on your connection card. We're going to have a prayer time. Talk to a person. Say, I repent. I want Jesus. I need Jesus. I need him. But I know that this little sponge really likes to jump into this one. Okay? And so please, your sober self that's here today, do whatever is needed to lock that cage up. Starve out the addicted self. Starve him or her out. Starve him out. I can help you with that. We can help you with that. Um, let's pray, and then I'm going to give some instructions for communion, and then we'll continue in worship as we, as we wrap up. God, thank you so much for bringing us the water of life, that your, your ways don't pass away like the world's ways do. And God, I, I, I pray the Holy Spirit would just touch lives right now. There'd be no shame in this room. This is a pretty strong passage of scripture that nobody would feel the shame of, oh yeah, I live in that. I'm the addict. Yeah, we all are in different ways. God, that's why we all need you, Jesus. May, may that be what people hear. We need you, Jesus. May you bring healing this morning into our hearts and lives where we say, I'm not content in the swill. I'm not content in that nasty, dirty water. I don't want my sponge filled with that anymore. I'm not content with that. I, I need some help. I need to get help around me. And God, will you give the courage today to take that step? Whatever that step is, may they write it on the connection card, turn it into the box. May they pray with somebody on the prayer team today to take that step. God, thank you for the freedom we have in you, Jesus. You are our hope. You are our hope in a dry world. You are the water. We need you, Jesus. We are so thankful you're there for us. Your well never runs out. Your water never runs out. You are the ocean. You never run out. God, so we soak in you. We thank you for loving us, Jesus. We thank you. Amen.